Greetings, friends. This is Chris Batts, and you're listening to episode number 25 of the Future is Bright podcast. Today's episode is part two of a two-part series with Sandra Cohen, executive compensation expert and managing partner of Cohen and Buckman in New York City. Today, Sandra shared about her journey to New York City, landing in the HR department of two large companies, then to a top Wall Street law firm. We discussed her reasons for leaving Sullivan and Cromwell, career advice for attorneys, her hobbies, and so much more. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes and YouTube. A bit more about Sandra. Sandra Cohen is co-founder and managing partner at Cohen & Buckman, a New York-based law firm focusing on executive compensation, pensions, and high-stakes employment matters. Sandra has over three decades of employee-related advisory expertise, originally as a human resource professional to two large Fortune 500s, and subsequently as an attorney in executive compensation, which includes six years at Sullivan Cromwell and 10 years at Osler, Hoskin, and Harcourt. She received her bachelor's degree in French from Washington University in St. Louis, her master's in organizational psychology from Columbia University, and her JD from Yale Law School. Welcome, Sandra, to the Future is Bright podcast. It's great to have you on the show again. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's a lot of fun to talk to you. So um, with a part two episode, I'd love for you to share with my audience uh, your why. Part of that uh, journey, um, even what it was like being raised in your home, kind of where you came from, how you ended up in New York. Uh, you went sh- straight into corporate um, human resources and mm-hmm. then made a leap. And just would love to hear that journey, and I'll have other questions for you. But let's start from the beginning. Right, sure. Well, I'm an Iowa girl. I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, where my family moved when I was about four. And people always say Iowa because I'm a New York City <laughs> person now, or it feels that way. So that gets a surprise. Um, but I, I did. I have Midwestern values. I think it's a great place to be from. I'm glad I grew up there. But I always wanted to leave. <laughs> we wanted to be in a more sophisticated place. And, um, you know, dreamed of New York. I, I went to college in St. Louis, Missouri. So that was the big city. And I thought I was going away to school. And not till I moved to the East Coast did I find out that no one else thinks I went away to school in Missouri from <laughs> Iowa. It's just one of those square states, right? Um, well, Washington yeah. University is nothing to <laughs> no. speak down. I mean, that was a fen- that's a phenomenal school, very sophisticated. Um, it's just not um, Columbia. Right. <laughs> or it's not uh, well, big city New York, but yeah. Look, I, I was very independent person as a young person. I think I was a young, mature uh, individual and wanted to be independent in college. And I think those experiences, you know, were very developmental. I couldn't just drive home for the weekend. It really is a six hour drive from St. Louis to Des Moines. So it wasn't, it wasn't really that close. So let's talk about this ticket you bought. Can you share that journey to New York? Sort of how I got to New York was after graduating from college without a job, and I would I was ambitious and smart and responsible. I would have been voted most likely to have a job at college graduation, and and I didn't. Um, I I wanted to be in New York City, and I wanted to do something international, and that seemed uh, glamorous and sophisticated. And I bought a one way ticket to New York. And I slept on my mother's cousin's couch for five days while I had interviews and informational interviews with alumni and I found a job and an apartment in five days which in this was 1989 in New York City that was a hard thing to do and I thought well New York likes me let me let me try it and I stayed never so (laughs) um does did any of this surprise your parents they knew n- no. I think they were <laughs> relieved that I was in the United States. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's so funny. I spent my junior year abroad in France, and I was a French major, okay. and um, maybe that's why I didn't have a job when I graduated from college. But I do value the liberal arts education, yeah. um, and I think they were just glad I didn't like move to Paris or something. I'm like, okay, she's in New York, but that we weren't. Uh, we hadn't visited tourists like it was not part new york city was not part of our midwestern life so and so i so appreciate your journey because it is 
I wouldn't call it non-traditional, but you didn't go straight to law school. What did you do? Right. Well, uh, first I got a job because I had to pay the rent and I wanted to not move back to Des Moines. Um, So I worked in human resources for about six years, six and a half years before I went to law school. And sometimes people say to me, oh, yeah, I took some time off, too. And I, I wasn't taking time off. I was getting a job. It had not occurred to me to go to law school when I was uh, or take the LSAT. I guess people were doing that, but I I didn't know that was a thing that I could do. I didn't know any lawyers. I think you graduate from college and you get a job and you find a career that's satisfying. And I sort of fell into HR through an informational interview with another WashU grad a few years ahead of me. And I started at at very large corporations. I worked for uh, first JP Morgan Chase now, which was Manufacturers Hanover back then, many mergers ago. And, um, you know, it was part of an HR department that had 500 human resources professionals in it. And I did a corporate, like a college recruiting, I think was the first job that I had. Uh, And then I moved to Colgate Palmolive after about three years, doing similar kind of recruiting, staffing, generalist work, and um, it, in those jobs, it was sort of a nine to five kind of experience. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at my boss's job and her boss's job. And I was like, I don't really want that job. How do I, how do I get to the top HR position? And um, at both companies, that person was a lawyer or had a JD. And um, for me, I was like, well, that's one way to get that job. And I sort of pictured myself advising, like, at the board table, what are the HR implications of making this, of this merger or of making this business decision? And I was always business minded. But, you know, when you're the junior person in a huge HR department, you you also have to to pace yourself, right? I'm 24, you're 25 years old. So I um, pursued a master's degree in uh, psycho- in organizational psychology from Columbia, which I did at night while I was working full time. And that, um, the process of getting that degree was originally for, you know, ambition in human resources career. But I think during that time, I, I got interested in the law, and how that impacts people in the organization. Uh, I'm still fascinated by the psychology of it, how groups work and how office politics work. And that still informs part of my job as an executive comp attorney, um, helping organizations find what's the right incentive for their uh, company and why are they pursuing like this stock option plan? Does that, do they have the other pieces other than money also in place? Um, But that's, that's a, That's a different story. But some point during the master's degree, as I'm completing it, um, I'm starting to tweak towards aspects of the law, even even at that time. And I also thought, hey, I I can go to graduate school. I could probably go to law school. And then it kind of clicked on. Maybe I should take the LSAT. And I did. And you ended up at Yale. I did end up at Yale. And that opens a lot of doors. Ones that, uh, you know, 25 years, my 25 your anniversary is coming up this fall and ones that I think are still sometimes opening that network, that alumni network um, and those experiences, you know, I'm very grateful for being there. Um, A lot of my classmates at Yale don't always stay practicing law like I did. um, And they are professors and judges and running for office governors. uh, And uh, it's interesting to see what, they've done. And then they probably look at me, you know, like I'm still practicing law. Yes, I am <laughs> using my law degree. Yeah. You know, um, so you did that. I, I know you all mentioned that you married your spouse right before law school. So some other big changes that took place. Um, it, why SNE, SNC? Why Sullivan and Cromwell? Well, um, I actually got that, uh, position as a, I was there as a summer associate. And I, I think, you know, I was interested in corporate law. SNC also had an employment law department. So I didn't want to shut out being an employment lawyer. Um, but early, but I was interested in, in the business of law and other, other businesses. So it was also very civilized. I had an excellent experience there. I, Definitely worked like a dog for six years. I mean, we would work around the clock. 
on um, what are important bet the company kinds of matters. And at least that's what we told ourselves when you're at a big firm that, that, that explained it. But I really did like it. I thought people treated me well. I had good colleagues. And I got a lot of experiences working at a, any of those Wall Street firms um, at a time when M&A activity was very mm -hmm. hot. And I was, uh, my first role was a general corporate lawyer, okay. including an M&A attorney. Um, I gravitated towards the employment parts of the M&A deals. Mm. And that made me become an employee benefits slash executive compensation attorney. But it came from the transactions first, the deals, who's going to be the new management team when you merge this company, and how much you're going to pay them. And who's going to be gone and how much are you going to pay them to leave and those sometimes take a dedicated um, attorney sure. on the deal team just to focus on those issues and there's also golden parachute taxes and aspects that um, you know need significant focus so I got a lot of responsibility quickly I think SNC was very good to me um, where I never felt like a cog in the wheel of a huge firm I always felt like I um, had interesting work and people respected me and, and um, eventually I had the opportunity to leave. I was about six and a half years and um, was a big Canadian firm, Osler, Hoskin and Harcourt was uh, expanding its New York office and its New York presence and they wanted to do cross-border uh, M&A transactions and so I joined in order to support uh, their M&A team and I was also always very entrepreneurial and they were you know tr starting something new practicing US law it's uh, in addition to Canadian law from Canada and um, that appealed to me because I always had like an entrepreneurial streak an interest in marketing business development the business of law and you know a big firm a big Wall Street firm doesn't necessarily need that from their associates they just want you to turn out good work and you're not bringing in clients that that are gonna make move the needle for them but um, being in the US office of a foreign firm that did give me the opportunity to pitch business and decide what kind of business are we going to be in and what uh, how deep a bench strength do we need how much should we charge for our services and so uh, I was a partner at Osler for 11 years, sort of wow. um, advising on cross-border executive compensation matters and um, uh, really had uh, developed an advisory practice in this for uh, Canadian corporate companies that had U.S. business. So if I understand you correctly, um, mm -hmm. were you able to bring business with you to Osler? Um, so, some, there was overlap in some of the clients and, and yes, I continue to bring some business with me, but it's also, I'm talking about pitching biz, new business for sure. Osler once we're there. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you know, did you and then, yeah. assume responsibility? I mean, six years, I mean, you became a partner at six and a half or seven years in your practice, basically at Osler, is that correct? You know that that that's right. I, f I felt like I was on a partner track at Sullivan and Cromwell, and I wasn't going to leave that uh, future opportunities um, to lateral. So I joined Osler as a partner, um, and then became an equity partner after that, as at, before my seventh year of practice. But remember, I had worked for six years. I was already I, by then. I guess that's by late. 30s. Um, so I had both business experience and law experience. Um, and then at Osler, I ran my own uh, practice. That's awesome. And also had other attorneys that advised on ERISA matters and, uh, you know, anything that, that came that touched the employee relationship uh, came my way. And that's pretty junior to not have a whole department around you. And so some of the hard parts of that, like making, you have to make the decision on um, it, you, you have judgment calls in advising clients that um, it's helpful to have more experienced lawyers. And I'm, I'm grateful there was a you know, corporate tax lawyer or a corporate M&A lawyer at Osler that I could come and say, hey, how, yeah. how would you advise on this? Um, do you feel that there was a difference between the U.S. firm and the Canadian firm, cultural differences or ways of approaching things? 
Well, I think that um, I think the Canadians did. I think they were <laughs> concerned about New Yorkers and New York lawyers being, you know, very aggressive. And um, but I felt very comfortable with uh, uh, Canadian culturally. They're um, nice people, and I think that came, I felt Midwestern welcome there. Um, and also, there were some really smart women and top positions at yeah. Osler that I could get to know and admire and they, you know, balanced family, didn't hide family issues. They um, were upfront about that and uh, that made it a welcoming place to work. Awesome. And it all kind of led to starting my own firm about seven years ago. So then when you, if you're an entrepreneur and you're interested in, um, Gee, where where does our work come from? How do you get clients to trust and 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 commit to their problems to you, to you? Um, and I certainly spend a lot of time now thinking about uh, business development, how to do it, and what's important, and where does my uh, business come from? Um, but now we're a boutique of eight lawyers, all practicing in employee benefits, pensions, executive compensation. Um, some employment law, and yeah. With with what you do, what do you like the most? Well, I I like coaching uh, my clients and and advising them. I take a lot of ownership over their problems, so sometimes that keeps me up at night too. And I know you know some people might be jaded and think, well, lawyers are getting paid to address the problem, but but the. That's not that's not enough. You have to like really care yeah. about their issue, whether that's negotiating a new employment contract and the stress that goes into jumping from one job to another, or someone's getting a f company founder getting pushed out and needs advice on how do I, how do I navigate the situation to make the best I can for it. Um, so, what do I like the best? I also like the tax. So I am a tax lawyer. I will only say that I'm a tax lawyer to certain lawyers. So if there's <laughs> if there's tax lawyers in the audience, I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm a tax lawyer to them. Those, no, I, no. I don't do corporate tax. Some people say regular tax, but there are multiple sections of the tax code that impact all kinds of compensation, from stock options to pensions to deferred compensation, and um, I like that more than I ever thought I would. I, I never asked to be a tax lawyer, but now I definitely am. I've written articles and books on the taxation of deferred compensation uh, or contributed to books and uh, on uh, stock op global stock option plans. Uh, so I guess I am a tax lawyer now. To some audiences, they think I'm an employment lawyer. Um, and I wouldn't, to an audience of employment lawyers, I wouldn't probably call myself an employment lawyer either because I'm not a litigator. I don't sue anybody for harassment. Um, I do help uh, our clients navigate employment disputes, negotiate complex issues. Um, and then I uh, hire employment lawyers to, if it can't be settled, you know, to litigate. Other people are better at that than I am. It's a, it's a powerful thing to know really what you are and let others focus on their strengths. Um, it, Sandra, would love for you to share maybe some anecdotal advice. You've, you've had an incredible journey, incredible run. You're not done. And um, I have an audience of all <laughs> kinds of ages and professionals, particularly in the legal industry. Um, what advice would you give my listeners? So let's see. Advice in career Topic or yeah, I mean, business so development. It, it could. Uh, let's start with career. So we, we just we just walked through your career um, as of to about now, mm -hmm. um, the different choices, the different things that were driving you. So there could be a voice for, advice for that. It could be advice for women. Yeah, yeah. Um, who are thinking the same? Well, career wise, for the junior people, but this advice also I think goes to more senior people I talk to every day in my job, um, and that is to sort of. Branch out outside your organization to develop your own, um, I could say brand, but your own independence and your own wings so that you can fly, that you're not as reliant on your boss, your boss's view of you. And uh, that's when sort of I see, I help people out of troubled situations where they think they're not doing well or they think they're going to get fired. And sometimes it is they are very reliant on one person. So branch out. Like, what's that mean? Industry groups. 
take a leadership role. If you're a junior person starting your career, you're not going to just grab a leadership role yet. You, you know, organize some panels for the conference. You don't even have to be the speaker on the panel, but you're the person that contacts the speakers and gets it done. Provide content. You know, just be known as someone who's going to uh, work. Um, I did that in human resources. Uh, we had a peer group of college recruiters, and we'd get together to talk about, I don't know, where to stay on campus at certain colleges or just any other tips like that. As a young lawyer, I also started a peer group of executive comp and employee benefit lawyers, um, which the, the partner in my group at Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, who I'm, I'm very grateful to, Max Schwartz was a great mentor to me. And um, he used to talk in a department meeting about his breakfast group. Um, and then they discussed some tax problem this morning. And here's one firm thought A and another firm thought B was the right answer. And I said to him, you know, can I come to your breakfast group? And I was a second year associate. And he's like, no, <laughs> but you can start your own. And I thought I could, how would I do that? And he, he sent an email to his breakfast group. Does anyone else have junior associates who are interested in ERISA oh, and employee benefits? Nice. Um, my associate, here's her email. She's starting a group. And then, um, SNC paid for lunch and we all got together and we, that group has been meeting um, almost once a month now for 24 wow. years, 23, 24 years. Um, and it's different versions of the group, but that has been really important resource to me, especially when I went to be the only employee benefit lawyer at a firm when I was a, a six year associate, when I moved to Osler, then I had this external network well, I could ask questions of how, how would you advise your client on this new legal problem? Wow. Um, other advice to lawyers, young lawyers, I, I, um, I, is, you know, thought leadership and expertise comes first. You have to be a good lawyer. You have to, you know, find an area. People say find a niche. Doesn't, I don't know if that's that much important, but find something that you interests you enough to write about and talk about so that you have shown thought leadership. Create your own blog if your law firm doesn't have one. It, it doesn't matter. Write on LinkedIn. You don't have to get published by a major publisher to show that you know what you're talking about. And then business development, you know, that's a close second. So at this point in my career, that looks really important. How do I keep eight lawyers busy with satisfying work? But you can't do that without first having some credentials and expertise in your area. Um, and so what's been some of the ninja tricks you've learned for business development? How have those clients come to you? <laughs> well, it's so, sometimes I like to say it's not it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Yeah. So what does that mean? <laughs> like, it's not who you know. Of course it's who you know, right? No, it's who knows you. And that goes back to the, the expertise building and the credentials and who's heard of you. And um, it, it, it's relationships. It's like people that know you. They feel like they know you. How do they know you? And there's a lot of tools for that from social media to LinkedIn to staying in connection with um, – Every, law school classmates. Um, and I think business development is really like watering a tree. You know, you don't make progress right away. You don't have an agenda. It's a small amount of water all the time, every day, long relationships. So my business lar largely comes from people who have known me a long time. Um, and if you want to be sort of strategic and calculating about it, it's like, okay, how do I get more people to have known me a long time? Yeah. Um, and, and that's work I've did through the American Bar Association Leadership Committee. I was on panels. I chaired a committee. I uh, co-authored a book. Um, I still do a lot of speaking at, you know, PLI panels and um, try to make friends. And I, I still love that peer group from 22 years ago. We are, they are partners at 25 different law firms. We trust each other enough to ask questions. Um, and I'm really very grateful that it's group that now in my career as owning a law firm, it's those uh, lawyers who refer their clients to me. 
because uh, they know and trust me and they know what they're going to get. Sandra, you brought up something earlier about that move from SNC to Osler, and I wanted to let you share to my audience um, advice for the parent. So it could be the mom or it could be the dad, mm -hmm. but the one that has a family and still wants to be a phenomenal lawyer and do well, what advice do you have for people as they're wrestling through some law firm cultures or work cultures in general? Right, right. Well, um, I, I teach uh, at NYU Law School. I'm an adjunct professor. So this is some advice I give to graduating law students is I'm like, pick your spouse very carefully or partner very carefully so that it's someone who's very supportive of your career and wants you to succeed and like get something personally out of having um, you be a professional and a lawyer because, you know, you're going to be a mom or a parent also, um, but the stress of having a partner at home saying, when are you coming home all the time is, is really fracturing and, and it hurts both the work relationship and the personal relationship. So I'm, I got very lucky in that department that I picked well and he, he's really a, a huge champion and support of, of my career at every stage. Huge. Maybe starting my own law firm, he's a little nervous because he <laughs> certainly liked the big the perks of having sure. a spouse as a partner at a big firm but um i think that uh that's come he's come around on that topic uh yeah the, the other advice is like look you know you don't get to have it all at the same time <laughs> so you're gonna have it some days it's gonna be way more parenting and home life and some days it's gonna be way more work and so balance it's never in balance it's like one and then the other yep. um but i've you know i love remote work i like not commuting into the city those many hours that are wasted doing that when i could be um either with my family or pursuing a passionate hobby everybody has to draw a boundary and draw a line and even at sullivan and cromwell i i drew boundaries. And yeah, I worked a lot of hours, but I lived in New York City and I, I'm an Iowa girl in New York. So if we were going to go get tickets to a Broadway show, yeah, I, mean, I, I had uh, other colleagues who are associates that wouldn't buy the tickets because they're like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to leave the office in time. And, you know, I would buy them because I'm like, well, if I don't buy them, I'm definitely not going to the show. <laughs> and if I do have tickets to something, I will probably figure out a way to carve out some time and go Make do it. it. Work. Mm -hmm. For you. So knowing that you're still a New York resident, how are you enjoying your spare time? Well, I, you know, look, I'm, a, I'm an equestrian. Okay. So I spend a lot of time and I have sort of arranged my work life to ride and train horses. I, compete, I compete in dressage. Oh, wow. And um, that is very important to me. So and I also have two sons. Um, teenage sons, one, one's in college now, um, so I have spent a lot of enjoyable time on the sidelines of many sport games and uh, wrestling matches and football games, and I love, I love that. I love being cheering them on on the sidelines. That's so fun Good for you. Um, do you have any top recommendations of restaurants or favorite places in New York? Oh, boy. Oh, well, that, that's right. And, um, you know, I don't usually go to the same place twice because okay. there are so many choices. There are so many choices. So I don't have a name off the top of my head, but I love good food. So, you know, I'm always following recommendations and, and want to try something new every single time. Awesome. Yep. Sandra, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Chris.